Aquarius. My name is Ethan. Uh, I'm a third year student in Penn's Neuroscience Graduate Group. I'm Vanessa. I'm also a third year in the Neuroscience Graduate Group. And I'm Rizal. I'm the last co-chair and I'm also a third year grad student in the Neuroscience Graduate Group. Uh, and we're all members of GLIA, which is a student group within NGG focused on neuroscience outreach, professional development, and community building. Um, so the public lecture series started in 2014. This is our 16th event, and it's the fourth one to take place fully virtual due to COVID-19. And probably the last one, we're hoping to go back in person starting in the fall. Um, purpose of the series is to inform the Philadelphia community about where your tax dollars are going, what we're do doing, uh, what researchers in Philadelphia are doing um, at UPenn and surrounding institutions in the field of neuroscience. Um, we thought long and hard about which topic to cover uh, this semester, and we're happy to say uh, that, we're ha that we chose neuroepigenetics, uh, DNA dynamics of the brain. Um, so throughout this uh, event, we encourage you to participate in the chat, ask questions uh, using the ask a question feature, um, which both of those can be found on the right hand side. Um, and then there is going to be, uh, there are gonna be three uh, talks. After each talk, there will be a QA and a session. And then at the very end, we'll have a Q&A panel with all our speakers. And at that point, you will also be able to raise your hand and, um, and actually come on screen um, to ask a question if you want. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Vanessa uh, for a quick introduction to neuroepigenetics. Hi, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not able to see my slides now. Sorry, Ethan. Uh, doesn't give me the option. I think, oh, I think I can show it. Um, okay, it's the intro you. one, right? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you may need to scroll through for me then. Uh, my oh. apologies for this little inconvenience. Um, okay, so I'm going to give an introduction on to today's public lecture series on neuroepigenetics, DNA dynamics, and the brain. We, uh, we all have genes, um, but not those kind of genes. Um, and genes, I guess I'll just go like that, are sections of DNA that code for our particular trait. For example, gene A can encode for uh, hair color, uh, fin fingernails, and even your height. Uh, but um, there, the point is, is that genes can encode for many things, but there's more to it that, than you think. Um, as a reminder, DNA is found inside your cells, and our whole body is composed of cells. And so every cell of your body contains the exact same DNA code. If that is true, then how do we have different cells, especially the different cells that make up our organs? Uh, such as our liver, our heart, and our brain, all of which have many function and functions and keep us alive and allowing y'all to be here today. One of these different, um, well, how cells can uh, become these how we have these different cells is essentially is how each cell can turn on or turn off genes that are aligned to become these different cell types and their different uh, functions. This is also can be considered uh, gene expression for which it is the process by which the instructions are in DNA and are converted into a functional product, uh, in this case, making brain cells. So how exactly do genes turn on or off? But just a reminder, each cell has the exact same DNA code, right? We have our DNA. DNA is so long that the cell has adapted a way to make it nice and compact. One way is through these key players called histones. Histone proteins are critical for packaging your DNA into chromatin, 
essentially a chromosome and into your cell. And um, you'll get to learn about histones by one of our speakers today, Erica Korb, and you'll learn how histones also play a role in the regulation of gene expression. You can also think of them as traffic, con traffic controllers or gatekeepers, if you will. They um, can control when genes are going to be turned on and, or when genes are going to be uh, turned off. One example is of um, acetylation, where histones receive a chemical modification known as acetylation, and this allows regions of the DNA to be open and not compact, right? So they're all compact inside your cell. And this chemical modification known as acetylation allows DNA to be nice and open, allowing other proteins and other factors in the cell to turn on a gene. In this case, a gene that encodes brain cells or neurons. And just as there's a signal to turn on, uh, to turn on there's obviously a, single, a signal to turn off. Um, this type of chemical modification is known as de uh, methylation. Here I'm showing an example of DNA methylation because you get to learn more about it from our second speaker, Hong Jung Song. And essentially, this methylation gives like a stop, a no, don't make me signal to the cell. Um, and in the example of neurons, you might see regions of DNA or histones that are methylated because you want to make sure genes that encode for liver or heart cells, heart cells are turned off, right? Um, a neuron shouldn't be expressing genes that are encoding for a liver, right? Because they are neurons. And so here I just gave you two examples of how genes can be turned on and off. And I'm sure you'll learn more about these different um, types of modifications throughout the talks today. Um, but while uh, your D D regions of your, uh, genes are found within regions of your DNA, um, did you catch that all of these type of modif modif chemical modifications are actually occurring on top of your DNA? And so that's essentially what epigenetics stands for. Epi meaning on top of things that are happening on top of your, your DNA, your genetics. And these are reversible changes that occur to your, to your DNA throughout your lifetime. Um, for example, your environment or stressors or your lifestyle and even your diet, diet can induce epigenetic changes that can determine when genes are turned on or off. One well-known example of this is agouti mice. Uh, pictured here are two genetically identical twin sisters, but epigenetically different. Uh, the mice in yellow have a mutation in the Guti gene that it makes them, these mice, obese and yellow, and even more susceptible to having heart disease uh, or even diabetes. We would expect these unhealthy mice to give birth to unhealthy offspring. Well, in 2003, two scientists named Waterland and Jertle showed that it is possible to silence the Guti mutation. Uh, such that female mice that were fed a diet that was rich in methyl groups, the methyl groups seemed to silence the Guti gene and the offspring were born healthy. Studies have also shown that there are correlations between human maternal health and the health of the offspring, which is why mothers are encouraged to have a diet that is rich in folic acid during their pregnancy because it helps with proper neural development. And so I hope you came here today to obviously learn about neuroepigenetics. And while this field is obviously amazing, I hope um, you have some questions in mind or leave with a takeaway of what neuroepigenetics is. When I think of neuroepigenetics, two questions always come to mind. And these are how, how do changes in our DNA affect our brain and how do these changes uh, affect our behavior and the way that we interact with the world. So today you'll hear from uh, many three speakers. Um, you'll learn about how histoproteins in the brain are tiny but mighty from our very own Erica Corp. You'll learn about DNA methylation and the mature mammalian nervous system by our also our very own Hong Jun Song. And lastly, we have another Philadelphia scientist from Temple University, Matthew uh, Wimmer. And you'll learn about how he uses multi-generational animal models to unravel mechanisms underlying addiction susceptibility. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead um, 
stop sharing the slides, Ethan, and give an introduction on to Erica Korb, our first speaker.